Welcome and thank you very, very much for coming this morning. Uh, we'll try to, to walk through uh, the referendum items and, and uh, I'm going to work on the constitutional issues. Dr. Moore is going to work through the bylaws and uh, Mr. Snodgrass is going to work through uh, a couple of the sport reg changes. Uh, and so hopefully we'll try to get you to the uh, district athletic board group meeting and the awards here as soon as possible. All the information will be contained in the, in the blue booklet. So uh, if you need a, a blue booklet, uh, we have a couple of up here where we have some open seats. Uh, so if you need a seat, there's a few in the front. Jeff uh, did a very, very good job of welcoming uh, the district board members. Are there any school board presidents or media? I know we have some media people in here today. Welcome. Uh, state legislators, I don't know, uh, Cliff Height, I don't know whether Cliff was told us he may be able to make it. Uh, we do have sign-in sheets uh, on your table, uh, so make sure that you uh, sign in and we'll get those collected after a while. Thank you. And there is a list of the uh, Northwest District Board. Uh, there's a list of our staff and the organizational piece, and these are all the referendum process. The ballots uh, will be mailed to all principals in a first class mailing. Uh, that mailing either went out yesterday afternoon or tomorrow or, or this morning, but it'll be out uh, uh, in the, on the road today. High school principals shall vote and return the original ballot with a signature no later than Wednesday, May 15th at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. 7th and 8th grade principals, because there is an item on for the 7th and 8th grade principals, uh, one issue, and, and they'll need to complete and sign their ballot and return it also. And please share the, the booklet and the script with your administrative team uh, as you sit down and, and work through uh, your, uh, the issues on the referendum ballot. Uh, get the superintendent, principal, and AD together and uh, use your administrative team to come together uh, to go through all and review those items. The referendum process is a, all referendum items are approved by the board of directors for inclusion on the ballot. Uh, all items, if approved, become effective August 1st unless identified uh, specifically uh, with another date. The alternative dates will be denoted on the slides in your ballot, but also they would be deny, uh, delineated out on your ballot the day you vote. Due to the strong interest in all the changes, please consider making sure that you share this information with everyone. Make it available to the, the public in, or on your website uh, and remind everyone that the results of the referendum ballot will be posted on the OHSA website uh, and that would be on the 16th. Uh, we have people coming in to, to help with the counting on the morning of the 16th, so that would probably be shortly afternoon on the 16th that we would post uh, the results. First issue, uh, 1C, and it's to revise the Constitution. Uh, it's 811, and the effective date would be August 1, 2014. And if passed, this would amend the article to stipulate that all ballots shall be received in the OHSAA office no later than 4 p.m. on May 15th. Uh, the current reading, it says May 15th, and sometimes you'll get uh, ones that are postmarked on the 15th, uh, but they don't get there for three or four days. And so uh, the stipulation would be all the ballots need to be there uh, in the office by 4 p.m. on the 15th. Now that wouldn't uh, go into effect till August 1st, 2014, as far as the referendum. 2C, an effective date would be August 1st, 2014. Facts about the constitutional article 819 requires that the principal return the ballot by the deadline. Uh, this one was uh, one that there's been a lot of conversation about the last couple of years because of the high number. Well, I think most people would be tickled to death to get 78% uh, return rate on their votes. Uh, we are right, that's where we're usually between 78 and 80%, but we have 160 or 170 uh, schools that do not vote. Uh, this uh, actually this uh, suggestion came from our media advisory committee 
uh, because the Media Advisory Committee, when we met uh, after two years ago after the referendum and those numbers were 170 or 175 schools, uh, they were asking, what in the world can you do to help encourage principals to vote? So uh, this one says the principal would be required to return the ballot by the deadline. There's not a requirement for the principal to vote. We would certainly hope that if you're going to return the ballot that you would vote, uh, but the requirement would be that you are to return your ballot by the uh, 4 p.m. on May 15th. 1B, the competitive balance. This isn't something anybody's heard about, I think, for a while. Uh, as you're well aware, uh, this is the fourth round with the competitive balance. Uh, when the issue last year uh, did not pass, and, and let me walk you back 12 months, uh, the ballot issue last year uh, had a roster piece to it, uh, and it came on very, very late, and there was a lot of people that were concerned about the fact that it came on late. Well, let me kind of walk through with you. If you remember last year, uh, before that referendum item came on the ballot, there was a petition that had been approved to separate the tournaments. And that petition had enough signatures. The board approved it to go on the ballot, and it was going to be voted on uh, in the springtime. Uh, during the early spring, uh, we had a lot of schools asking us, well, okay, if you split, what are the tournaments going to look like? So we were trying to put out information about what would those tournaments look like, and if you split, what sports would you keep, what sports would you not keep. Uh, we had made the decision that there were three sports that we probably would not keep, uh, gymnastics, field hockey, and ice hockey, just because of the simple numbers of non-public schools was so small, you're not going to end up having a public school tournament. So when the group that put the petition on to split the tournament, found out that we didn't really want to cut tournaments out. We just want to split the tournaments. They agreed to separate and say, okay, we'll pull this off the ballot. Uh, and that was the Friday morning of the boys' state basketball tournament, which you realize that's the last week in March. So we were rushed because we're going to be going out in, in April for these meetings. And so... The ballot issue last year, I, I think, was in a hurry. It was. And we did a survey after the issue failed last year. We did kind of a real quick survey with the principals. Uh, got a great response, great response from the principals. And we tried to listen and see what they had to say. And one of the things that they said is this thing kind of seemed like it was in a hurry. And I think they were absolutely, that was an absolutely legitimate concern. And so we brought the Competitive Balance Committee back together last spring. And there's some of those people who are sitting in this room. And we brought them back together, and we said, okay, this issue was very close. The issue last spring, if 10 schools vote the other way, it passes. It was that close. The farthest that any of them have been have been 19 schools. They've all been close. And so what we said is, Let's listen to what our schools have to say, and let's try to model uh, a proposal on what they tell us that we need to, to listen to. One of them was, that seemed like it was in a hurry, and, and I believe that it probably was. And so we then tried to put some pieces together on suggestions that they had, and that's what you're going to see before you today. The charge, the membership has expressed an extreme interest in the OHSA developing a more equitable plan. We did two surveys. As I mentioned, the first one was a, an early survey so we could kind of listen to, okay, what were the issues? Uh, and actually, two of, the, two of the issues that came out from the principals was the EMIS numbers. If you remember a year ago, the EMIS numbers were came out of ODE and, and there was no clue in rhyme or reason how some of them got the, your, the numbers that they received. Legitimate concern. And the second thing was, please remove the tradition factor from the 
referendum ballot. Well, the, refer the tradition factor wasn't on last year's. So we, it wasn't on last year's, and it's not on this year's. So uh, one of the pieces that have come with that is they want and they voted uh, in that second survey, uh, do something about the competitive balance piece. That was the number one concern from the survey. Number two was please help with transfer and eligibility. The competitive balance one was four times higher than number two. So there's an extreme interest on the part of, and, and that survey was done by Paul Fallon. Paul Fallon probably does some surveys for some of you because he does a lot of work in Ohio. Uh, and he surveyed almost half of our member schools. To develop and propose a plan that's reliable, to develop and propose a plan that can be clearly applied and fairly administered, and the ultimate objective is to promote competitive equity and ensure that student athletes will continue to learn the life lessons in an education-based setting. This is about high school sports, and high school sports are not about AAU teams coming together and playing together. It's not about grabbing kids from everywhere and putting them on your roster. It's about taking your kids, and if your kids and your roster doesn't end up that way, then there'll be a modification on how they're going to be put in their division. The philosophy. The vast majority of the competitive balance committee is opposed to separate tournaments. And, and I, when I say vast majority, uh, it's probably 26 out of 27. But the proposal that you see in front of you today was unanimous. Even the, the person that uh, was the author of the petition to separate uh, has voted to support this. When participating in OHSAA tournaments, schools want to look at their opponents and believe that they have a reasonable chance of competing. And because of the notion that public and non-public schools are inequitable, the committee closely examined what may be the root cause of any such inequity. And that conclusion is besides the enrollment number, the composition of a team's roster where did the kids come from is a significant factor in affecting competitive balance. This means determining where each student's parents reside, if it's a public school, or from what educational system the student came if it's a non-public school. When a team's roster is comprised of a number of students whose parents do not reside within the school district or the attendance zone, or the student did not come from the same system of education as that school. There may be a modification in how that youngsters in, in that school are put in a, their division for the tournaments. Our surveys have indicated that the membership is interested in the OHSA board and competitive balance committee continuing to work to find answers to competitive balance. This issue does pass. The Competitive Balance Committee is going to stay together, and they're going to work on whatever suggestions that come from each of you. The board and committee, they recognize that this proposal does not address all issues and concerns. I don't think that there's ever any way that you can put a proposal together or a plan together that meets every issue at the very beginning, because there's going to be things that are going to concern and, and are going to occur that you just don't know. And so uh, they will address those. And they do believe, however, that this plan will create a better system than the current system. The board and committee took last year's plan. They listened to the issues raised and have attempted to address those concerns. The board and committee are committed to continuing to study this issue and work on ways to improve the formula. This plan is a starting point and any feedback and data collected during the initial rollout will only strengthen what changes can take place in the future. Any changes to the formula will continue to be voted upon by the membership. That came also from uh, the surveys. There was a concern last year that changes would be recommended at, from the Competitive Balance Committee, 
Uh, and if and they they will be recommended from the competitive balance committee to the board, but it'll come back to our principals for a vote. Any change in the formula, that is a change from last year. We acknowledge that there could be some situations in which students will be assigned factors that are too high or too low because of unknown circumstances. Is two for football too low? So let me tell you why our sport factor, and that hasn't changed from last year, that whole piece is the same. Why it's two? Because we have seven divisions. In one of those divisions, we have 72 schools, and most of the rest of them, the other six, have just a tad over 100. If you have a sport factor of 10 or 8 or 5 for football and you have a roster of 50, you're going to be jumping schools a couple of divisions. The intent on this is not for people to be jumping three and four divisions. It's to move people up out of that division if they have, depending on how they've got their students, that kind of a modification to the formula with them. But with there only being 100 schools in that division, basketball has 200 schools in their divisions. One kid on a basketball team, probably one out of five, probably has a little bit more impact than one out of 11 or 22 on a football team. So the variance that you have in the sport factors is not only because of the players on the team, but how many schools in the division. Soccer is six because we have three divisions. Football has seven divisions, and all the other four division sports, that sport factor is a five. And the only change in that from last year is soccer is a six. We didn't have the value for soccer at that last year. We realize the system will not account for students whose parents make a bona fide change of residence because the student wants to play for a certain program, a certain coach, or to join his or her friends. There isn't any way we can deal, stop that now. If somebody makes a bona fide move and they move into that district, by law they're going to have the opportunity to have the rights that that affords them. In fact, when we were going through the, the, the program with that, one of the, the superintendents on the group said, well, there's not a thing we can do by law, and, and that is correct. We realize that this system does not address the majority of the Division I issues. The committee will be meeting to address these concerns. The, we tried to deal with the D1 starting with football. And the reason that we started with football is football is a sport that not every school has the opportunity to make it to the tournaments. So we added the seventh division for football. And honestly, when we, did, when we added that, we thought it was going to be primarily to help Division I. And it did help Division I. But actually, when we finished the tournaments to listen to the schools that were involved, there are more schools that are in the lower divisions that will tell you it helped them more than they would have ever believed because we had two of those that played in the state finals this year that would have never made it if we hadn't added the seventh division. And it wasn't in Division I but just how it rolled down through the divisions and the changes that it made. So we made an effort to try to help the thing with Division I, but the Division I issue still has a disparity between the top and, and bottom of the Division I and some of those other sports. We have a committee that's going to be meeting, and it's uh, eight or ten ADs, and one of them from Northwest Ohio, uh, because you don't have a ton of Division I schools up here. But we are going to have a group of people to sit down and say, okay, what kind of things can we do to try to help Division I? Honestly, I don't think that that's adding another division. And if you stop and think about that, if you have five divisions in basketball and you're already at the state tournament and it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you're going to add another division. It's either going to be Sunday or Wednesday, and, and we've tried our very best to stay off Sunday. But we also know that if you're, if you're imposing on another day of the week, uh, with all the, the testing and pieces that are going on, that's a struggle. And so we have to try to look and see if there are some other ways to try to help the Division I issue uh, without adding divisions. The plan is not anti-school choice, and it's not penalizing students. Uh, the school choice piece uh, 
is one that we deal with a lot. And being in Columbus, we deal with that a lot. We hear it a lot. Uh, we have a lot of uh, bantering back and forth about making sure that everything that you do is not an uh, impediment towards school choice. Uh, you're well aware that the House Bill 59 last summer added homeschoolers uh, another choice. Uh, the budget bill that just passed added community schools. It's in the Senate now. Uh, and so the school choice piece is a piece that's going to be here to stay. And what this uh, hopefully will try to do is that we can also track kids. It'll help you track kids of where kids are coming from. The Competitive Balance Committee, 27 members, three administrators from the OHSAA office, two executives from the Jerry Klinke and Kirk Hamilton from the BASA, Ken Baker from OASSA, Bruce Brown from OIAAA. So the leaders of our educational groups are, have, are on this committee. We have 10 superintendents, four principals, six ADs, a coach, and a former AD. They're your colleagues. And they've worked very, very hard, and they tried to listen, and when they come back to their league meetings and, and the, the meetings that they go to, to what you have to tell them, and they've brought that to the committee, uh, and they've been very good about that. The changes from 2013. Data from the roster submitted during each school year will be utilized the next school year. This was an absolute suggestion that came from uh, the ADs and our district boards. The ADs were saying at the beginning of the season, it's too much to do. Okay, absolutely granted. And our district boards, if you do that at the beginning of the season and then the district board's trying to find sites for sectionals and district, they have a very, very short time line. And the other piece, if you do it at the beginning of the season, you don't know what division you're in. So for scheduling purposes, that's an issue. And so we're going to use the roster from the year before. And so that way you'll know by the end of the year what division you're in. Not a question. And they'll have the opportunity, each district board will know what sites uh, to be able to, to place tournaments. The factor impacting non-public school students will be the feeder or system of education that students attended continuously since the seventh grade rather than the district residence of the parents. Last year for a non-public school, uh, we had two classifications actually for publics and non-publics last year. For a public school, every kid that lived in your district that was on your roster was a zero. And that means the zero means no addition to your EMIS number. For the non-public school last year, the non-public school sat in the attendance zone where their building sat. So every youngster that was in the attendance zone where their building sits would have been a zero last year. What we didn't realize, and I mentioned to you earlier, that uh, we, we only had a couple of weeks, that we have buildings that sit in places where that's not where their, their kids come from. I'll use Lima Central Catholic. Their building sits in the Shawnee School District. But you think Lima Central Catholic, their kids come from Lima, and they do. Canton Central Catholic, where would you think their kids come from? Canton. Their building sits in Maslin Perry. So one of the things that we heard at the end of the, the year was that the school should have the opportunity then to choose their feeder, and that becomes their zero. What school, where do their kids come from? And so that is a change. Why? Well, the kids are going to either be zeros or ones. When we get to the one part, I'll walk through that with you. Because they're either going to be zeros or ones, so they're going to have a very minuscule change. A smaller secondary factor has been added. This will be known as a level one factor and will have a factor of one. For public schools, and this is one that we heard all, very often after the uh, survey last year, Open enrollment students will be signed a level one factor. 
That means any youngster that has been open enrolled in your school district, and they've been there since the seventh grade, would add a one. Last year, they would have added whatever the sport factor is. We have an awful lot of public schools that have an awful lot of open enrolled kids. In fact, there was a superintendent that stopped me yesterday and he said, we have more open enrolled kids than we have kids that live in our school district. And so one of the things that we did hear from the, our public schools was, please give us the opportunity that if that youngster has been open enrolled and they've been there since before the seventh grade, we start with the seventh grade because that's when sports and schools start in the state of Ohio. They start in the seventh grade. There was a lot of conversation about should it be earlier, should it be ninth grade, but uh, if we choose the, the, the seventh grade because that is the year that sports start uh, in our schools. For non-public schools, students who did not attend that designated attended or designed feeder school, but demonstrated a commitment to the same system of education continuously since the seventh grade will be assigned a level one factor. Let me use, uh, and I'll just make up an example. We have uh, a high school called Bishop Smith. Bishop Smith has a Catholic elementary school right across the street, St. Mary's. They believe that they're, they're sitting in that district. Well, in this, they could say they were sitting in the district, but let's just say they were sitting in the, the district next door. But they get their kids, predominantly get their kids from bishops uh, from St. Mary's. St. Mary's for them, because it's their feeder, would be a zero. But three blocks down the street, there's a, a, another elementary, and it's called St. Michael's. That's not their choice. St. Mary's was their choice. That's their zero, the same as the kids that live in the public school where mom and dad live. But the kids in St. Michael's have been in that same system of education all the way through school. But they're not their choice. They would be a one, just exactly like a youngster in a public school who's open enrolled. Mom and dad don't live in that district, but they've been there since before the seventh grade or starting the seventh grade. They would be a one. The youngster on the non-public side would be a one. That's no matter what sport. No, no matter what sport. They have the opportunity to choose once every two years, the same as the EMIS number. When the EMIS number is going to last for two years, they would have the opportunity then to say, if you're Bishop Smith, St. Mary's is our feeder. That's their feeder for every sport for two years. You don't switch sports and you don't switch at the end of the year. One time every two years. For non-public schools, the student who did not attend a designated or assigned feeder school but had the commitment to that same level of education since seventh grade, that would be a one. That would be for each of the, the independent schools, the Jewish schools, the Lutheran schools, all of the independent non-public schools, private schools. A sports-specific factor has been determined. Sports-specific factor has been determined for the sport of soccer, as I mentioned to you earlier. We did not have that in there last year. It will be six, and I have met with the soccer advisory committee board, and they're fine with that. They understand we only have three divisions. And so you're going to have a broader swath of teams in there. And these factors are different for some sports because of the different number of tournament divisions for particular sports, along with the varying numbers of participating schools within each sport. Teams will be limited to moving up a maximum of one division each year. The basis will be what division the school would have been placed on its most recent EMIS number. So when that EMIS number comes every two years, wherever that puts you, the maximum from there is up one division. That way, if you had a school that was growing and they'd gone up uh, 150 kids, then that's the starting point for them of where they're going to go. Otherwise, the, they would get the benefit of the growth uh, and the change in their division. 
There will not be the ability for a team to opt out of the formula, even if it could demonstrate lack of competitiveness. There was conversation about that uh, with the proposal last year. More concrete plans regarding an online method to input rosters and post information about rosters has been discussed. Should the proposal pass, the system will be developed. The starting point for placing schools into their respective tournament divisions. The initial enrollment count is just exactly like it's always been. It's the EMAS count for males and females in grades 9 through 11 as submitted to ODE every other year. The schools will submit their initial roster count through an online system in team sports of football, soccer, volleyball, basketball, baseball, and softball. This will include all participants in grades 9 through 12 who are eligible or expected to be eligible during that season. Although submitted every year, information from the initial roster count will be utilized the next school year. So you're going to be using the roster from the previous season. A two-week period, and this is a suggestion that came from a group of ADs, uh, so if there's a, a thought about this fits, works, doesn't, please let us know. But this came from uh, an, probably 20 ADs that were uh, in a room that felt like this was probably the best time to do this. The two-week period for submitting their initial roster count will begin after week one of the regular season and end after week three. And these would be dates that would correspond to this current season. The initial roster counts may be updated after the sports season. Students can be added who became eligible. You may have a youngster that was ineligible and becomes eligible late in the year and you want them to be able to play in the tournament. You could also have a youngster that didn't get a chance to play and, and not, not that they weren't eligible and didn't get a chance to play. We had a young lady in our girls basketball tournament that tore her ACL uh, before the season started. They kept her on the roster and she was sitting on the bench in the state tournament. She didn't get a chance to play, but she was on the roster. So that would be one that they would have the opportunity probably to ask, can we have a waiver for that young lady? She never played a minute. But they may not have to do that, because if she lives in the community, she'd be a zero. So it would probably only depend on, on where that, that youngster would fit. Or if you're in the middle of your division, the, that one player is probably not going to make a difference anyhow as far as on your account. Students can be deleted if they never became eligible to participate during the season that was just completed. And those deadline dates were put together by ADs and that was their suggestions for those. And I think they were tying those to uh, the ADs would be in working on uh, rating officials at that time. So they would be already in working on that. Every participant on a team's initial roster count will be assigned a level zero, a level one, or a level two factor that will be assigned on a sport by sport basis. The level two factor shall be sport specific and called a level two sport factor. The factors for public schools are dependent upon where the student's parents reside or if the student was continuously enrolled in the district since seventh grade. And that should be the beginning of the seventh grade. They started seventh grade there. The factors for non-public schools are dependent upon the school from which the student came, the feeder school, or if the student was continuously enrolled in the same system of education since seventh grade. The level zero factor means each student on a particular team's roster meeting the criteria of the factor will be multiplied by a zero. So that number will always be zero. Mom and dad live in that school district. And that youngster's on your roster. That youngster is always going to be a zero. And there'll be absolutely no addition to your Amos number. A level zero factor for public schools means the parents of the student reside within that school district in a single high school. Or if it's a multiple high school, they've been designated or assigned attendance zones. We do not have attendance zones in every multiple high school district in Ohio. We have in a lot of them, 
uh, most of them, in fact, but some of them that we do not have those in. We've already sat down with uh, either the director of activities or the superintendent and said we need to draw an, uh, an arbitrary line here because that line's going to determine whether you're a zero or a one. So it has no other effect. Uh, Cincinnati, I'll use that as an example. Cincinnati used to have attendance zones for every high school. And when Cincinnati went to their choice model that you can go anywhere you want to go, they kind of eradicated the lines. We have to go back and put the lines in. We sat with Canton. Canton had four high schools. Now they're down to two. So we have to draw a line there between Timken and McKinley. And the superintendent knows, and they're working on that piece. We're doing the same thing for the new uh, magnet school in Dayton. So many of the schools may not have a current uh, line there, but they'll have an attendance zone. And in the multiple high school, that youngster in that attendance zone, attending that high school would be a zero. A level zero factor for non-public schools means that the student attended a designated feeder school continuously since the seventh grade. They've been in Bishop Smith and they choose St. Mary's. The youngster's been in St. Mary's since the seventh grade started. They're a zero. The level one factor, and the level one factor is an addition this year. And the level one factor is an addition that came from uh, the feedback that we received from our principals. The level one factor means each student on a particular team's roster meeting the criteria of the factor will be multiplied by one. Any youngster in a public district that has been open enrolled in that district since the seventh grade, and he's on your roster, he's going to be a one. Big change from last year because last year he would have been a sport factor. The level one factor for public districts with single high schools means that the student's parents reside outside of the school district, but the student was continuously enrolled in the school district since the seventh grade. He's been your kid, and that's what I think principal and superintendent after superintendent said, those are our kids. They've been our kids. Many of them have been there's uh, tuition since second grade. Mom works in the district. She's a teacher in the district, and she's, her child has been there since the first grade. They started them there, but now the child's in high school. They've been there. Mom and dad live outside the district, but they've been enrolled in that district. They've been that district's kid. There'll be a one. A level one factor for public districts with multiple high schools means that the student's parents reside within the school district but do not reside within the school's designated attendance zone or the student's parents reside outside the school district but the student was continuously enrolled. He's been open enrolled in that district since seventh grade. Any open enrolled youngster that's been there since the, the seventh grade is always going to be a one. For a multiple high school district, if you have two high schools and you have the line down the middle, one high school here, one high school here, and you have your attendance zone. Mom and dad live in this district and their youngster goes to school in this district, that youngster is a zero at that high school. They live in the same school district. They live in this attendance zone and the superintendent assigns them to this high school. They're a one. They live in the same school district, but they're outside their attendance zone. The superintendent makes that assignment, that youngster is going to be a one. He's not coming from outside the district, he's in the same district. The level one factor for non-public schools means that the student attended the same system of education continuously since seventh grade but did not attend the designated assigned feeder school continuously since seventh grade. Let's go back to Bishop Smith. Their chosen was St. Mary's, it's across the street. St. Mary's coming into Bishop Smith is a zero. But St. Michael's, a mile down the road, youngster comes into Bishop Smith. He's been there since first grade at St. Michael's. Same system of education but not the chosen feeder school. He's the one. Just exactly like your multiple high school. Same, same district, same system, same kind of education, but not in the chosen high school attendance zone. 
The level two sport factor means each student on a particular team's roster meeting the criteria will be multiplied by two for the sport of football, five for the sport of volleyball, all the four division sports, volleyball, basketball, baseball, softball, and six for the sport of soccer. A level two sport specific factor for public districts with single high schools means that the student's parents reside outside your district and the student wasn't continuously enrolled in the district since the seventh grade. Mom and dad live outside. Youngster has not been open enrolled. At least since the seventh grade. If he's open enrolled coming in the ninth grade, he'll be under this one. That youngster would be whatever the sport factor is. He's from outside your district. He's not one of your kids. A level two sport specific factor for public districts with multiple high schools means the student's parents reside outside of the school district's designated attendance zone and the school district and the student was not continuously enrolled in the district since seventh grade. So for a multiple high school district, for that youngster to get, to get the sport factor, mom and dad live outside the district, he hadn't been open enrolled, he's now enrolled in the ninth grade coming in from a district outside, he's a five if it's basketball, or two if it's football. He's from outside your school district. He hadn't been there, and mom and dad don't live there. A level two sport factor for non-public schools means that the student did not attend the same system of education continuously since the seventh grade, and therefore did not attend a designated assigned feeder school continuously since the seventh grade. At Bishop Smith, youngster, Lives, you know, goes to St. Mary's across the street, we said that youngster's a zero. If he came from a Catholic elementary down the street and he's been there since the seventh grade, he's a one. If he comes from the, any other high school, he's going to be the sport factor. After the level zero, the level one, and the level two factors have been applied. The counts generated from the level one, zero, and two will be added to your EMIS number. That number will then be used to put you into your new tournament division. After all those numbers have been added, if it's a four division sport, you go through and you make four cut lines, four new lines, you have four new divisions. The initial enrollment count, which is your EMIS number, you add your zero, uh, and adding zero isn't going to do anything other than you say you, you made sure you had that category because there are always going to be zeros. But you would add your ones and twos, and that would give you, you your new tournament division number. The anticipated effective date for this plan is the fall of 2016. This will allow for the piloting of the plan during 15 and 16. The OHSA will work with public high schools within multiple high school districts to establish the line between zeros and ones. The OHSA will provide help to schools with the roster questions that would be needed. We have people that are going to be working with us and they're retired ADs, principals, and one of them is a superintendent that we call compliance support people and they're going to be going in and out of schools, helping them with this piece. It's not a lucrative position. It's a, it's a stipend, and they're going to get a pass to go to ball games. And so we have a, a number of these people that are going to be going. Uh, in fact, we had a question on the other day about, well, who will check? Well, we have people that if, if you had a concern about a district that was close, uh, where a kid came from or whatever, uh, then you would certainly have the option. Usually they call, and, and I would imagine that wouldn't change and we would have a compliance support person go in to check and make sure that that roster is okay. Non-public schools must submit their designated or chosen public school attendance zone by the deadline for initial roster submissions. These attendance zones will be in place for two years. Schools that fail to meet the deadline will be assigned the public school attendance zone. If they don't choose a feeder, they're going to be sitting in the, the district where 
uh, their building sits. Non-public feeder schools will be located in the attendance zone of the public school district. The attendance zone shall be designated or chosen by each non-public and they will be assigned an attendance zone by the OHSAA. Non-public schools will be permitted to apply the sport factors to students who attend all feeders within that attendance zone, whether the attendance zone is designated or assigned. A public school's current district and or current established attendance zone for a multiple high school and a non-public school's current assigned or attendance zone designated will stay constant for two years and will not change on a sport by sport basis. Once they make that determination, it's in all sports for two years. A non-public school, also referred to as a private school, one that is religious school, Catholic, Christian, Lutheran, Jewish, or independent school. And I know that we had the, the, the question came, I'm thinking about Worthington Christian. Worthington Christian uh, High School, there, there, there's a number of, when you look through and it says Catholic, Christian, Lutheran, we have, if I remember correctly, I think there are two schools or systems in the state of Ohio that do not have a feeder. One is, I think, Hillcrest Academy in Cincinnati, and the other one is Cleveland Lutheran West. But with Worthington Christian, Worthington Christian sits in the Thomas Worthington attendance zone. And their 7th and 8th grade feeder school sits in the Worthington Kilbourne attendance zone. So it's, that's their 7th and 8th grade that comes into the high school. So their choice, their feeder would be, we're going to choose our 7th and 8th grade. But most of the privates and the independents that are up in Cleveland all have either K through 8s or their own 7th and 8th grade and they're not always attached and they're not always in the same building. And they may not even be in the same district. Students are considered to be from the same system of education. We don't make that determination about whether it's the same system. The Department of Education has made that and they've defined that through uh, the Ohio Department of Education and the Catholic Conference of Ohio, Ohio Association of Independent Schools, the Association of Christian Schools International, or, or other categories have all been denoted and they're all designed through the Department of Education. On a sport by sport basis, schools will be limited to moving up a maximum of one division per year and that's after the EMIS number. Schools that fail to submit their roster count by the deadline will be subject to penalties and or fines. And schools that fail to submit their initial roster count at all or have been found to falsify the school's roster numbers, and we would have a probably a compliance support person go in to check that, will be ineligible for the OHSA tournament in that sport. Future questions, and, and there's probably these are just some that came from uh, the committee. Should the plan be adjusted to handle the continuous movement of students? When you, you look at the, the choice piece, that piece is going to continue to grow. As uh, some of you, I think, in our meeting that we had last uh, August, that we had identified 14 ways that youngsters could be playing on your team and either not live in your district or not step foot in your high school. And if the current uh, budget piece happens, that's going to grow very, very quickly. That's in the Senate right now. But the movement of youngsters is going to continue to occur. The choice piece is going to continue to grow. Should the plan be applied to individual sports? Currently it does not. Uh, when it started, it really wasn't a, a thought about that, but uh, that comes up every now and then. Should the other sports all be included in this? Uh, one that we also hear is the uh, t wrestling duels because it's the team sport. So, but it wasn't started as we started this process. So that one is one I know that there'll be a conversation to continue to grow about. Should a modification occur to impact the enrollment disparity in Division I? We mentioned that the Division I is an issue. We have a committee of ADs that are going to be working on that piece. So uh, I'm sure we need, we're going to have to work on that. How much it, it ties in with this, I don't know. Should the plan be applied to schools that do not demonstrate a level of competitiveness? 
Is the inclusion of students in grades 9 through 12 on the initial roster count appropriate? Are the level one factor and level two sports specific factors appropriate? You almost have to go through a cycle to, to be able to answer that piece. But we did try to at least stop and think, okay, if you, if you raise that too high, you're gonna be running people uh, from a very, very low division through to the top of the, the largest division. And that really wasn't uh, the purpose. Is the plan impacting student participation opportunities? Are schools limiting the number of students on their rosters in order to stay within a certain division? There's probably much more chance of that occurring if you do that at the beginning of the season rather than if you're using your roster from the, the previous year because that's already going to be intact. Is the online system together the initial roster count working as anticipated? Should a more stringent check and balance system be implemented to ensure that the initial roster count is being submitted? and being submitted correctly. And we would be using compliance people to do that. And is the plan truly making an impact on competitive balance? In your booklet, you have a check sheet, and I thought would take a couple seconds and we'll just go through that with you. Single high school. XYZ high, uh, their EMIS count 400. And this would be in the sport of soccer. So you can see it says soccer down there with a six. The six is there because that's the sports factor for soccer. 40 youngsters on the roster. 25 of those youngsters, mom and dad, live in the school district. So 25 times zero is zero, so there's a zero under the 400. So those 25 kids whose mom and dad live in the school district add nothing to your EMIS number. There are 10 youngsters on this team who've been open enrolled. They've been there since before the seventh grade. Those youngsters, 10 times one, and that's, remember, a change from last year, would add 10. And it's a, it's a big change because last year, those youngsters would have been sports-specific factors. Last year, those kids would have been 50. And our schools were saying, wait a second, they've been our kids. We need to make a modification. And this is what the committee came up with. So 10 times 1 would be 10. So if there are 40 on the roster and 35, either live there or have been open enrolled, there are five youngsters who are on that roster who came from outside of the school district. Mom and dad don't live there, and they haven't been open enrolled. They're from the outside. Those five times the sport factor of six gives you 30. So their count for being put into their division would be the EMIS of 400, zero for the factor of mom and dad live there, 10 for the open enrolled kids, and 30 for the kids that have come from outside the district. So their divisional placement number is now 440. Make sense? Okay. Multiple high school. XYZ, there's two high schools in this district. Their EMIS count is 200. It's a sport of basketball, so you can see the five down there and it says basketball by the sport factor. 30 youngsters on the roster. 20 of those youngsters, mom and dad live in the school district. 20 times zero, zero, so you have a zero under your 200, which is your EMIS number. There are five of those youngsters who've been open enrolled since the seventh grade, beginning of the seventh grade. Five times one would be five. So that leaves five youngsters from outside the school district. Five with the sport factor of five would be 25. So their new placement number for their division would be starting with their EMIS number of 200 zero for the kids that live in the district, 
five for the open enrolled kids, and 25 for the youngsters that have come from outside the school district. So their new total would be 230. Let's go back to Bishop Smith. Their Amos numbers, 300. Sport, we can use volleyball. I don't think we got the VB in there, but we use volleyball. But that sport factor is five. 30 youngsters on the roster. 20 of those youngsters come from St. Mary's across the street, which is their feeder. Those 20 times zero would be zero. They have five who come from St. Michael's down the street. They've been in the Catholic system or the, you know, if, if they've been the Christian system and they come to a Catholic high school, that's a different system of education. This is only the same kind of education as delineated through the Department of Education. So five times one for those kids would be five. And they have five youngsters that came from the public high school down the street. Those five would be 25. So their new uh, number would be 300 for their EMIS, zero for the kids that came from their feeder, five for the kids that had been in the same system, and 25 for the kids that came from the public high school down the street. So their new number would be 330. Follow? Okay. We want to get to Dr. Moore and Mr. Snodgrass. We'll be here all day, afternoon, and whatever. We'll take every question, and the migrant question we'll get.